Good evening, Berean. It's good to be with you this evening, and we welcome those of you who are online. Thank you for joining us for our Bible study this evening. Tonight is a open mic night, and so I will be addressing questions in the second part of our where we normally have our Bible study. But I do want to begin, as we normally do, with a review of this morning's message. So we, we began again in Acts 15, but we have finished the Jerusalem Council. And so we concluded that a couple of, couple of messages ago. And so this morning we began what will be Paul's second missionary journey. It, it begins technically in chapter 15, verse 36, although actually the journey has to get ramped up first. And it'll go all the way to chapter 18, verse 22. I began this morning in my introduction by focusing on the relationship between Paul and Barnabas. In this event, in this uh, text, at the end of chapter 15, we see a rather shocking event take place, the separation of Paul and Barnabas. And so I wanted to begin the message by reminding you of just how critical their relationship was over the years. And so I traced for you in a very overview fashion when they met in Acts chapter 9 and then um, how they came together later in ministry and service and then eventually even went on a mission trip together. And so that was the first part of the sermon. It was just a, a, a quick reminder of the relationship of Paul and Barnabas. Then we jumped right in to the second missionary journey. The first part of our, t our the message this morning focused on chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. And there we saw the separation of Paul and Barnabas, the separation of Paul and Barnabas. And there were three events that I looked at here. First, the desire in verse 36 to go on a on a follow-up missionary journey. And so the second missionary journey does not begin as the first one did. The first one was a very formal event. The Holy Spirit came into an elder, an elder meeting, spoke audibly to the people, told them to separate Paul and Barnabas. They fasted, they, uh, they prayed, and then sent them out. So it was a, a very official uh, uh, event that took place in Acts 13. This is not nearly as official. Uh, Paul and Barnabas were at church one day and they said, hey, let's, 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 go, let's go back and see how things are going. And from that, I discussed a little bit with you the, the reality of a pastoral care that elders are to have for the congregation. That we're to, the elders are responsible to care for the, for the flock. And, and Paul had that pastoral heart. We normally, we normally look at Paul as a, as, a, as a theologian, as a doctrinal giant, and of course he was those things. But Paul was also a pastor at heart, and that's obvious from his desire to check up on the churches. So his desire, verse 36. Then we looked at the disagreement as Paul and Barnabas try to put together a team of men they, they can't get past John Mark. Uh, Barnabas wanted to take Mark. Paul didn't want to take Mark. And the wording here in the Greek text by Luke is very important. Number one, this was a very vehement disagreement. Number two, it was an ongoing disagreement. In other words, as they were planning this trip, they kept rehearsing this issue over and over again. I mean, Luke paints this as an ongoing back and forth between Paul and, between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas, time and time again, bringing up Mark, wants, to, to, wants Mark to go. Uh, Paul, time and time again, refusing. And in this text this morning, what did we see? Well, in Acts 13, all it tells us is that, is that John left and went home. To, it doesn't tell us why he left. And in this text, we get a little bit more information. He wasn't going on good terms. In fact, Paul says he abandoned, basically, the, uh, the mission trip. He didn't, he didn't go on to finish the work to which they had been called. And so Paul sees no reason for them to entrust their ministry welfare to this young man. He is, as far as Paul concerned, he's not going to finish the course. And so both of them are strident on this, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, our, our 
translation says there was sharp disagreement. There was sharp disagreement. It's, it, this is the same word that I, I pointed out to you that's used in Hebrews 10, 24, translated as stimulate. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Stimulate and sharp disagreement, same word. The reason that, that, that the translations of these two texts are so different is because this Greek word had both a neutral meaning and a negative meaning. The neutral meaning was stimulate, and that could be both negative or positive, depending on the context. And the negative one was um, to incite, to incite. And so this was a, this was a situation that, had, that had, was marked by incitement. And no way around that. Uh, Pastor Perkins and I had a conversation after, ser after service on this idea because you hear some pastors preach this text and they try to make it seem like this wasn't that much of a disagreement. Well, it was, it was a major disagreement. They were having a serious problem here. Uh, whether we like it or not, I know that we don't, you know, Paul's our hero. We don't, we don't want to think of him being up in arms or with, with somebody, but it's hard to get around this particular text. The wording that, that Luke uses the, la the uh, language that Luke uses, the, the grammar of this text, indicates that this was a serious disagreement between these two men. So the decision was made, verse 39 and through 41, Barnabas took Mark and went off to Cyprus. Of course, Cyprus was where, where Barnabas was born. He was from Cyprus. Mark was his cousin. And so in a sense, Barnabas is going home, but I argued this morning, it's not just a matter of going home. Now, Cyprus was the first stage of the first missionary journey. Paul, 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 Paul opened up this, this passage by saying, let's go revisit the people that we preach the gospel to. Well, that first missionary journey, I argued, was divided in, into two parts. Cyprus was one part, and then they went to the, mother, to the uh, mainland and did the second part in southern Galatia. Well, Cyprus was the first part of the, the mission's trip. So in essence, there's, there's two missionary trips here. Barnabas and Mark is one, and they do go, go to Cyprus. And then Paul makes the decision. He decides to take Silas, and they go through the, not sailing like he and Barnabas did the first missionary journey, but they travel north through Syria and Sicily. I showed you on the map this morning, and they make their way to southern Galatia. That's the first half of the sermon. And in the second half of the sermon, we looked at verses, chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. And there we see Timothy, for the first time in Scripture, drafted into the missions team. Here, here he's a young man. Um, of course, a lot of us know Timothy from the epistles. He pops up literally all the time. Uh, he was Paul's right-hand man. And uh, Paul had a great love for Timothy. Timothy had a great love for Paul. Well, we meet Timothy for the first time here in Acts 16. And we learn, uh, so in verse 1 and 2, he discovers Timothy. We find out that he is a bi-racial, bi-ethnic young man. His mother was a Jewess, and his father was Greek. And uh, we also learned that his, uh, I talked a little bit about his mom and his grandmother, both was, were saved. His father was probably unconverted. And uh, here Paul in verse 3 does something that is shocking to some people. He decides to, to circumcise Timothy. Uh, Timothy was uncircumcised. His father did not circumcise him. He was a Greek. And so uh, Paul decides to circumcise Timothy. And at first, that kind of seems shocking to some people, particularly after Acts 15 and all of the, 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 the discussion they had about circumcision. But what I argued this morning was this was a, a good decision by Paul. It was wise. Timothy was a Jew, so why not circumcise him? He, he wasn't a Gentile. He would have been considered a, a Jew by, by, by the Jews. And so Paul, in circumcising Timothy, removes that as a point of discussion. He removes it. Uh, Timothy is circumcised. Let's move on. And then uh, the continuation of the, of the missions trip, verse 4, as they continue to move forward in retracing their steps from the first missionary journey. So that's the, that was the morning's message in about five minutes. <clears throat> Any questions on the morning's message? Any questions on the morning's message? Go ahead. Yes, Ajay. Uh -huh. um, just a uh, thought and question, Pastor Doug. About, uh, by the way, it was uh, written in the forms. Uh, I named them for this 
exact reason that, um, that you mentioned today for, to, that he's the son of encouragement and that he did not give up on him. Uh, that was the motivation for me to name Ezra Ezra, like middle and bottom. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the thought that came to me was thinking about Barnabas' sort of trajectory of his life. He had actually discipled or taken in Saul and, and he was converted to to think and sort of disciple him, if you will. And you see from Acts 10 to Acts 15, this sort of, you know, Barnabas and Saul, yes. to then Paul and Barnabas. Yes. And so this this hierarchy or sort of the precedence that, that was changed and Paul's prominence growing yes. in that regard. We also learned from Colossians, seeing that Mark was Barnabas' cousin. Um, it's, and, and then in, in Peter, uh, Peter refers to Mark as his son, yes. as, at least a spiritual son. Uh, in that, in that, at least I think it's a spiritual son. Yes. <clears throat> and perhaps his disciple. In so far as the the attribution that we make to Barnabas' influence in, in so perhaps Mark's you know change. Is that, a, is that s supported in terms of like thinking just from this example, or is there other things that we are seeing that contribute to Mark's, you know, sort of uh, desertion to, is it, is it more Mark's cousin relationship, or is it Barnabas's sort of uh, mentoring and discipleship of, of, rather than maybe Peter's discipleship, and, that had been a greater influence rather than the Mark cousin relationship with Barnabas. I think Peter Peter comes into Mark's life. I mean, obviously Mark knew Peter in in the in the uh, Jerusalem church, but church history kind of tells us that Mark probably ran into Peter later in life. I mean, when you when you think about Peter as the backstory to Mark's gospel, Mark is writing that 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 gospel not at this time but later in his life. And so in all likelihood, uh, he's already um, tr transitioned from his relationship with uh, Barnabas and maybe is meeting up with Peter in Rome or something like that. And so I would, I would argue that the greatest influence was probably Barnabas, um, not as a cousin, but as a spiritual mentor, uh, which is what I, I tried to communicate at the end, end of the sermon this morning, that, that um, Barnabas, Barnabas was 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 clearly in as we look at his life, uh, as you said, the trajectory of his life. He's clearly a man that took interest in people, and uh, as I, was, I said, I was sharing I was sharing with Pastor Perkins this morning. I, I, again, I was struck. I told Pastor Perkins about Barnabas's actions without a formal office. You know, even, even before he was given a formal office in the church, he was doing ministry. He was serving the Lord. Uh, Barnabas didn't need an office to serve the Lord. And uh, yes, he, he becomes one of the elders in, in, in Antioch, but, but he had been doing stuff before Antioch. You know, and, and uh, so um, I'm, uh, it, just, it just impresses me, uh, people like that, you know, and um, um, I thought of myself a little bit. I mean, I, I, uh, when, I, when I went to seminary, uh, long before I, I had a, 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 a formal position in the church, I was doing ministry because uh, out of a love for the Lord, a love for, for us, um, this is what God wants his people to do. Um, this is what I saw in my home. I mean, b b both of my parents were lay leaders. They, they didn't have an official position. Well, m my father did a little, a little later, later in life. But, but they were serving the Lord even before they had a position to serve the Lord. And, and so the, all I saw growing up was, was serving Christ. 
um, in whatever capacity you could, and, and oftentimes it was in personal relationships. And so it was just natural for me to do that myself. Uh, and and, and, uh, and so, so that's the type of person that Barnabas was. I, I would agree with you that his life gives witness to that. And uh, he, had a, he, had a, he had a, clearly had an influence on, on, on Mark's life. Yes, go ahead. So, so P Peter is in some way mentoring later on yes. in, in Mark's life. So <clears throat> Mark, the gospel is written by John Mark. By John same, Mark. Mm -hmm. Is that from Papias and the church? That's church history. I mean, church, there's no, uh, and, and I would, uh, I preach through Mark, as you know, and there are a couple of, a couple of points in Mark's gospel that kind of lead you to believe that uh, it was Mark who, who, who was uh, writing it. Uh, church history tells us this. Some of the writing itself tells us this, and, and the context would allow for that. And so that's kind of how we take it here as a church. We, we, we kind of take Mark as, as the author of Mark, Mark's gospel. And, and I, I kind of laid out the reasons for that in my, in my sermon series, and so there you get gr greater uh, a detail on why we argue for, for, uh, for Mark and authorship. Yeah. All right. I don't know if, did, did my screen go out, uh, media people? That's what I was checking. You're, okay, you're working on that. Okay, good. We just want to make sure that if I need it, it's there. You, you go ahead. So in the, in the second part of the sermon, you mentioned about Timothy, Pastor, and, and the circumcision. So, and I'm just, uh, uh, under, I'm understanding that he circumcised mainly from a, to exercise the freedom so that it would not give an argument so that it would, so, uh, in other words, to, so the way we, we think about it is Christ, Christ ends the, the requirement of the law in circumcision. Yes. Period. There's no except. There's no. But still, Paul is Paul's circumcising Timothy to. But to Jews are still free to circumcise. So let's let's kind of leave Timothy out of it okay. for, 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 uh, for a while. Jews are free to continue to circumcise their children and did circumcise them okay. as Christians as a cultural reality. Okay. That that Jews still ate kosher. You know, they, they still circumcised their, their children. They still abided by many of the, the cultural realities that the uh, law had in it. So uh, even outside of Timothy, uh, we, we, history tells us that Jews continued to abide by, the, by the, at least the cultural elements of the law. So when Paul in Galatians is arguing st sternly and very much against yes. the legalistic aspects of the... I mean, one might see that as like saying, okay, you know, you're, you're sort of saying one thing and you're sort of doing another thing. How would you help explain that sort of obvious? Yeah, um, again, I, I, would, I would argue for, for the reason behind it being, being cultural. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's basically my, my argument, that this is, this is a cultural thing. Jews are known by certain cultural and uh, ethnic realities and uh, when, when Christ comes in, he doesn't tell us to stop doing things that ethnic people do. Um, the issue, in the, in, the, issue in, in the book of Acts, the issue in Galatians is circumcising Gentiles. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you were to read, if you were to read a little further ahead in, in uh, Acts 21, uh, you'll pretty see pretty clearly that Jews still functioned under the cultural realities of being a Jew. They didn't stop that. And there wasn't any reason to stop it because the, the, the issue again in, in, in Acts 15 is should Gentiles be circumcised? Nowhere in, that, nowhere in Acts 15 do they deal with, with, with Jewish circumcision. It's just not an issue because, because Jews did it for, for, for a, a cultural reason. And so the, the, only people, the only people being addressed in Acts 15 are Gentiles. Yeah. And that's fairly clear. Yes, uh, go ahead. We have a question online. Uh -huh. Yes, the question is, can you hear me? 
Yeah, the question is, um, this was from last week's service about marriage. Okay. And the question is, men were challenged not to aggravate their wives. Can you please explain further what you mean and how is it that done by men? Okay, how, how do men aggravate their wives other than by just existing? I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, that's really a joke. Uh, so how, how, do, how do husbands aggra uh, uh, aggravate their, their wives? Well, the same way they, they aggravate their children. Um, obviously, the wife and the ch child have a different relationship uh, out of the man. But in, in, in both cases, we're concerned with men who don't use their authority in a way to spiritually help those under their authority. And so when they're, when they're inconsistent, when, they're, um, when they don't, take into account that their wife is a joint heir, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, when they don't treat her as an equal, uh, but they use their, their uh, authority to either belittle her or to, um, or to, uh, or to keep her from um, experiencing the benefits of, uh, of, of equality in the household. Um, that's ways that, that a husband can aggravate, aggravate his wife by, mis, by misusing his authority in a way. I think I, I think I mentioned the idea of wielding authority rather than exercising authority. Wielding authority is, is uh, what I call male chauvinism. Um, that's, that's male uh, antagonism. Uh, exercising authority is, is male headship. And so male headship is, is different than male chauvinism. And so uh, a husband treats a wife as an equal. Uh, they have a different function, but he respects her concerns. He tries to integrate her concerns into the, into, into the decision-making process of the household. And he, he treats her as a joint ear of life, Peter says. Not of salvation, but of life. Uh, Peter uses that language because he's trying to communicate that she's an equal human being and should be treated as such. Those are some of the ways that husbands can um, misuse their authority and by misusing it, wield it rather than exercise it. I'm going to yes. piggyback on that. Okay. On you, question. Okay. I know that we have not transitioned over 